We have been um, studying through the book of 1 Kings, and uh, we've observed that uh, the Lord is showing us, sadly, what happened to the nation of Israel, uh, that the nation of Israel went through a fractured division. It started out unified, but it, but it divided. And um, it's a portrait of what would also happen to his church. It's kind of a portrait as to what's happened to mankind. I mean, mankind started out, let's say, united in, in a place and spirit with God in the Garden of Eden. And then man went through a division in his own heart and, became, and, and had a divided heart. And so we just see the portraits going over and over and over through the history of earth and mankind on this earth. And here in this particular uh, study, we're seeing historically that when things begin to get very bad, as we saw back in chapters uh, 14 and, and 15 and uh, 16, has the wicked king Ahab uh, married a, a, a girl who was a lover of idolatry and introduced strong idol worship in the land and the time was very dark in the land that the Lord brought a preacher to bring the word whenever there's darkness and the darkness gets thick God wants to bring a light and he brings a light and he brought this man Elijah and this man Elijah preached in the power of God and we saw in the last chapter in the 17th chapter we saw uh, Elijah's uh, prophecy. We saw him uh, bring forward in the 18th chapter the uh, proclamation to bring all the prophets of Baal and meet him on Mount Carmel. And we saw the contest there between the idols and the true God. And we saw the true God win the victory. The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And of course, then at that point, the Lord wanted the false prophets of Baal to be taken to the brook Kishon and to be slain there because God is jealous for his glory. He's jealous for his name. He's jealous for his truth, particularly in his land, particularly in his church, particularly in a Christian's heart and mind. And he wants any idols to be slain that you may have. And so, of course, we see this, uh, the end of the 18th chapter there after the great battle, and uh, when the battle was over and the prophets were slain and the idolatry was put away, God could bring his blessings back on the land. And the rain came and restored the dearth and the drought and brought back the foliage and the vegetation. And the rain came and we saw that the hand of the Lord at the end of the 18th chapter was on Elijah. And he girded up his loins and he ran before Ahab, the king to the entrance of Jezreel that's back at the city where the king lived and uh, now we're going to come to this 19th chapter and this 19th chapter will seem to be uh, kind of a, a strange chapter because boy the 18th chapter is a real mountaintop I mean you have one man against 450 prophets and the one man wins the battle because he's on the Lord's side and the Lord is on his side. And it's a mountaintop a chapter in the Bible. It's one of those great chapters, probably greater than the stories about Samson and his strength. And here's a man that wins this great battle. And, and we love reading this particular chapter. And, and right after this, what we're going to read is that verse 1, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And withal, how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, left his servant there, but he himself went up a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And we're going to see this amazing transition, this, this contrast here. In the last chapter, we see the prophet at maybe his finest hour, at, at his best. And now all of a sudden we see him perhaps in his lowest time and at his worst. We, we saw him in the last chapter strong in faith. And, and the helper of his nation, now we see him kind of filled with fear and deserting his nation as he runs away. Uh, he, he, he confronted 450 prophets in the last chapter. Men! Here he runs from one woman. 
quite a contrast. But what, what are we seeing here? Well, one of the things we're, we're going to observe quickly is uh, this is proof that God wrote the Bible and not men. If this isn't a proof of inspiration, I don't know what is. I mean, here the, is the Bible painting in vivid color the portrait of one of God's men, even to the point where he's fallen into green uh, wretchedness. Uh, the, the Bible, uh, if it was just Jewish men, and here's Elijah, one of the greatest Jews of all time, just Jewish men that wrote this book, perhaps they would have glossed over this incident in his life. Perhaps they would have omitted it altogether. Uh, this sad failure would have been forgotten. And all we would have heard about was the great battle with the 450 prophets. But, but here what we see is that, is that the Lord wants to show us that even his best men at their best are still men. He's going to show us that the, the strength that, that God in his manifestation of glory is going to use human vessels. And human vessels are weak. We're going to see here that, that uh, sometimes we expect too much of the men of God. And we forget that they're just men. And so God's going to paint the portrait here. He doesn't want us to get into the position where we're looking for heroes. We're so naturally drawn to hero worship. And that's not what God wants out of us. He wants us to worship Him, not His servants. And so He's going to show the truth here. Now, now getting back to this, I'm just trying to think about this uh, chapter here. Um, here, here's here's uh, this great battle that went on. Now, Jezebel didn't go to the battle. Jezebel stayed behind in the royal city of Jezreel in the palace. She had heard about the challenge that Elijah had ushered forth. Uh, she was told that uh, Ahab had to bring the 450 prophets of Baal whom she had brought into the land. And, and had to take them down there. She had known about the three years of, uh, of famine and drought. And, and she had been asking her prophets to win the victory. And they'd been unable to. But now they're going to have a chance to have a grudge match with the man that she hates, that worships the God that she hates, the Lord Jehovah. She wants the worship of Jehovah out of the land. So she waits back in the palace and off goes her prophets. One thing she notes is a couple days pass and all of a sudden the rain is coming down and her husband returns. And, and in her mind, these many hours that had passed, uh, she's excited and anxious to know how things turn out. Uh, she figured, boy, when the rain coming, it sounds like my priests have triumphed. They've won the battle. Yeah. Um, Maybe now 450 of them together in one place praying to Baal. Baal has now given them the victory. Once and for all, these Jews would see that Jehovah isn't worth being worshipped. We can stamp out the worship of Jehovah. We can make them forget about going back to Jerusalem. They can now turn to the God Baal and to my prophets. Once and for all, I've won the victory. Because after all, we know this famine it was Elijah's fault in the first place. And so, of course, my prophets and my God have gotten me the victory. That's what she's thinking until her husband shows up. And then her husband shows up and says, let me tell you what Elijah did. He, he slew all your prophets with the sword. Now, now curious. In, in the words here, look at what he says here, verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. It's interesting, Ahab seems to be omitting someone. This work that happened on that mountain wasn't the work of Elijah. This was the work of the God of Israel. The, the prayer of Elijah was, God, would you manifest yourself? Would you show these people that you're the true God? And the fire that came down from heaven wasn't Elijah's fault. 
He had no power to produce that fire. It was the God of glory, and Ahab makes no mention of God. No mention of the Lord. All he does is he mentions the man of God, but he forgets God. Now, this is not uncommon. This is a human problem that's gone on throughout history. If you were to go back, for example, in Numbers chapter 22, and in Numbers chapter 22, there was a king called uh, Balak. And, and this, this king wanted uh, to curse the nation of Israel. So he hired a prophet, Balaam. And, and he, he, he sent some people. He said, now go offer some money to this prophet and see with some uh, filthy lucre if we can hire him to come over and to curse those Jews for us. And what happens in the 22nd chapter, in verse 12, God said unto that prophet, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. And so God stops the prophet in his tracks before he goes. And the prophet, in verse 13, verse 13, Balaam the prophet, he rose up early in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Get you into your land, for the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. And then verse 14, and the princes of Moab rose up, and they went unto Balak the king, and they said, Balaam refuseth to come with us. No mention of God. Now, that wasn't the message they were just given. The message they were given is the Lord prevented him from going. The, the thoughts of the wicked, there is no God. God has no place in the thoughts of the wicked. Uh, whatever happens is just due to circumstance, the weather, science, anything, people, but not God. This is the way the wicked views things. Now, now it's okay if the wicked do this, but it shouldn't be for God's people. After all, Ahab grew up with some knowledge of religion. Ahab himself was a kind of a religious guy in the sense that he went to those prophets of Baal when they had their worship services. So ostensibly, he was a man that knew something about God. But the reality is, with the vast majority of people like that, religion is like sun Sunday clothes. They wear it one day a week and then put it off for the rest of the time. And there's no thought of God in their regular life. There's no thought at all. Uh, uh, look at all that Elijah had done, he says in verse 1. But Ahab, you were there. You saw the prophets strain for hours and hours and hours and pray and cut themselves and ask for their God to answer, and their God didn't answer. And then you watched God's man get up there carefully and in a short period of time just make an impassioned plea to the God of Israel to show himself real and even pouring water on the sacrifice and this God answered from heaven and did it in front of all the folks. That was God. No, no mention of God. God is not in the thoughts of the wicked. They'll attribute to the human instrument. They'll attribute to the human instrument whatever the Lord did. Whether he acts in judgment or whether he acts in blessing, God himself is lost in the sight of the wicked. He, the only thing he sees are the means he employs or the instrument he employs. For example, if, if God decides to chasten a land through a drought, and then sends a prophet, which he did, like Elijah, to tell the people there's a drought and there's famine in the land because of your wickedness. They don't see God. All they do is they see that man as a troublemaker and a thorn in their side. The man is the problem. They see the human instrument. If God turns around and decides then to bless a land and maybe send a prophet of revival like Wesley, or Whitfield, or Moody, or Spurgeon. When it's all done, all people remember is Westfield, Whitfield, and Wesley, and Moody, and Spurgeon. They don't seem to recognize that it was God working through those men. It wasn't the instrument. It was the one that held the instrument in his hand. They don't see it. 
It's very, very sad. It's just we're, we're focused. We're man-centered by nature. And even those that claim to be religious tend to be man-centered. And thus it was with Ahab. He had ascribed the drought and the famine to the prophet. And so when he gets back, he tells Jezebel, you know what he did? He slew your prophets. He mocked your prophets. Now, now he tells her these things because he wants to stir up her anger. Not to correct. He, what he should have been done is saying, dear, <laughs> let me tell you what happened here. I know you've been trying to get the worship of Baal going in the land, and I know you had 450 of your prophets, but one prophet of God overcame 450, and the Lord showed himself mighty. The best thing for us to do now is to forget about Baal and go back and worship the God of Israel. But instead of doing that, he's trying to stir up the anger. The famine hadn't turned him to the Lord. The famine hadn't turned her to the Lord. And now the blessing of the rain wasn't going to turn either one of them back to the Lord. And here is a sad truth. Whether it's the goodness of God through mercy or it's the harshness of God through judgment, neither, neither divine judgment nor divine blessing will reclaim and cause an unregenerate wicked man to repent. Very sad. Yet our job is still to preach divine mercy and divine judgment. Turn, turn with me, for example. Go to the second last book of the Bible, the book of Jude. It's, it's sad for us to learn these things, but God wants us to know the truth. To know it in our mind, know it in our heart, and know it in our lives and in our lips. Now, it's sad. Here, here's an example of where God had brought judgment, and then God had removed the judgment and brought blessing and mercy, and neither one would turn these two wicked ones back to him. So, so here, what do we do? Well, verse 21, Jude. Keep yourselves in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. It, it, we want to seek God's love and we want to seek His mercy. We don't want His judgments. And then what do we do for those outside? Verse 22, And if some have compassion, making a difference, tell them about the compassion and the mercy and the love and the grace of God. Verse 23, And others save with fear. And the others tell them the judgment of God. Our job is to be steadfast no matter their response. Because we're not serving them, we're serving the Lord. Now, now let me just give you some, some good news, perhaps. Maybe it's good. Maybe it's troublesome to the heart. Go to Isaiah chapter 55. But it is sad for us to watch that sometimes neither mercy nor judgment will turn these people's hearts back. But our job is nonetheless to tell them of the mercy and the judgment of God. Isaiah 55. He said, it doesn't make sense to me. Isaiah 55, verse 8, the Lord speaking. For my thoughts are not your th thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts would imply verb higher than your thoughts. Now here's what he says, verse 10, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow cometh down from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the ear, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. The words of the Lord have gone forth from his mouth. They've gone in to the prophets. They've gone in to the pens of the scribes. They've gone in to the holy words of the holy scriptures. They've gone in to us as we've received them. And then the job is to take those words and to let them be with all fitted on our lips and to come out of our mouth. So that what comes out of our mouth as we speak, it says the oracles of God and God's word come out. And he says, my word that goeth forth, verse 11, shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. 
and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So we preach mercy. We preach judgment. And many will not turn. But there are places in the mysterious workings of God that we don't know the inner workings of how He works in the hearts of men and how the preparations of the heart are of the Lord and how when He knows that certain seed that we sow is going to work and prosper in the area He sent it, but in many other places it's not going to. Nonetheless, our job is to make it go forth so it will not return void. It will accomplish His purpose and part of His purpose is judgment. It is appointed unto men once to die and after this, the judgment. And he wants to show them of the judgment. You were forewarned. They will be without excuse. And our job is to continue like Elijah in preaching. Now Ahab, Jezebel, they missed it entirely. They, they missed it entirely. I mean, eh, the, neither the divine judgment nor the divine blessing turn either one of them back to the Lord. Uh, the effect that would be produced by Ahab telling Jezebel what Elijah had done was to hurt her pride and to fire up her furious anger and temper and to get her to the point where she was going to take vengeance herself. That was the point. Sadly, and that's what we're going to see happening here. Uh, Ahab as a person, if you kind of read through, he's kind of sensual. He's kind of uh, materialistic. He's, he's kind of crafty. He really doesn't have any scruples. But I, I don't think of him. He, he's, he's not as uh, steadfast as Jezebel. Jezebel has a wickedness inside of her. Uh, she's pictured uh, later on in the book of uh, Revelation as foreshadowing the woman that rides the scarlet-colored beast. She has a, a hatred for God and truth and a love of idolatry and false religion. And Ahab is stirring her up. What had happened on that mountain, Ahab probably, it reminds me of Bill and Hillary Clinton, for a modern example. Bill Clinton, kind of an unscrupulous, crafty, fun-loving, sensual guy. He just wants to ride Air Force One and play in the White House. But that's not his wife. She's an ideologue. She's a hard, communist, socialist, leftist ideologue. And Jezebel, that's in the social sphere. These two are like the same in the spiritual sphere. And, and Jezebel is a hard spiritual ideologue against God. And Ahab probably would have gone either way. What probably would have happened is when those people saw the fire come down, when those people who are kind of in the middle said, the Lord, he is the God. What do you want us to do? And the nation, the Israelites and the Jews followed Elijah. They killed the prophets. What would have happened is there would have been a reformation. A reformation in the land. People would have realized we need to get back to our roots, to the Lord. We need to get back to the temple. We need to get away from the groves and the high places. That's what would have happened. And Jezebel was, I single-handedly am going to stop that. And the only way I'm going to stop it is by shutting up God's man. There will be no reformation. I will not have the worship of Jehovah back in this land. We're going to have the prophets of Baal resurrected. We're going to find more of them. And that, that was her thought. And so let the gods do to me and more if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow at this time. She has a hatred against God. She was implacable. That's uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 2. 31, 1, 3, 1. It's 13 forwards and 13 backwards. And those are the haters of God. And God wants to paint a portrait for us. And all through the Scriptures, He's going to try and show us the difference between the virgin, that's the bride of the Lord, the one who's chaste and humble and submissive to our Lord, and He's going to show us the whore, the harlot, the wild woman, 
the one who was a hater of the Lord and the one who was a lover of the devil and his religion and earthly power. And that represents Jezebel. That goes on to this day. That goes on to this day. And, and in those harloting religions and in Christianity, that would be Roman Catholicism. That would be mainline Protestant denominationalism. Every single one of them, the Anglicans, the Presbyterians, the Episcopalians, the Lutherans, every single one of those major harlots have abandoned the humble place at the foot of the Savior like Mary and have turned into harlots who have married governments and are looking for earthly, temporal power and large, wealthy, denominational hierarchies and establishments. Very sad. Jesus said this was going to happen. He said it's like a, the grain of mustard seed. I want it to be a small, pungent herb bush. That's all I want. Small. With a, with a pungency and an aroma and a savor that affects everyone around it. That it's different. But it grows into a big tree. Overgrown monster. And when it gets big, guess who comes in the branches? The fowls. Have you not seen that? And not just in religion, even in corporations, governments. If anything gets big, guess who comes moving in? The liberals, the fowls. You build it, we'll steal it. Once it's big, and when it's little, we don't, we're not interested. Not enough money, not enough power. But once it's big, we'll take it. AARP, a bunch of little retired people just getting together in the 50s and 60s. That's nah, no big deal. 70s, 80s, millions of people. Really? Look at that thing. Let's jump in the let's jump in the branches and take over. And now it's a communist socialist monstrosity. Really? You think that's how those little retired people are? They're communist socialist monsters? No, but the people in the branches lodged in they are. It goes on everywhere. And 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 little churches start out, but all of a sudden they grow into big monstrous denominations and the fowls come lodging and take over. And it's the same thing. Sad but true. History does not repeat, does not change. It repeats itself. There's no new thing under the Lord. So what's what's uh, under the sun? There's no new thing under the sun. So what's what's Jezebel going to do? Well, she can't get at the Lord. She can't get at Jehovah. But I can get at his servant. I can go after him. And that's what they do. They don't. They don't have the 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 confidence to blaspheme God, but they'll go after God's men. And so she she takes her malice and vents it on the service, the servant of God, and she goes after him. Now this is this is this has gone on throughout the scriptures. You go all the way back to when Moses was preaching to the Pharaoh and warning the Pharaoh over and over and over. God said, "Let my people go." And if you don't, God will show his mighty arm and his power. And all the way through that, and, and uh, Exodus chapter 15, I'll just read it for you. And what was the response of the, the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my lust shall be satisfied upon them, I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. And that was Pharaoh's thoughts of the servants of God. He couldn't get after the Lord, but he could get after the servants. You go in the New Testament uh, to the time that uh, Stephen preached to the Pharisees in Acts chapter 7. And, and all he did was he, he took the time to speak the words of God. And he talked about God's mercy. And he talked about God's judgment. He talked about God's Son. And, and what was their response in verse 54? And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. He was giving them God's word. Why didn't they curse God? Well, it's easier to go after God's man. And so we're going to see a pattern throughout the scriptures. If you're going to stand for God, if you're going to speak for God, if you're going to serve God, don't be surprised if people come after you personally. That's who they're coming after. They're not going to come after your God. They're going to come after you. And, and they gnashed. They, they gnashed on him with their teeth. And they cried out with a loud voice. And they stopped their ears. And they ran upon him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city. And they stoned him.
Now, the Lord in His goodness, He, he sends His Word. He sends His mercy. He sends the Word of His judgment. He's kind. He sends mercy again. And they resist and they harden their heart and they resist and they harden their heart like Jezebel. And what happens is by constantly rejecting God's Word, by constantly resisting the Spirit of God that's at work in the servant of God who's ministering the Word of God, eventually God pulls back and abandons that individual and gives them over to a reprobate mind. And at that point, point that reprobate mind is a form of madness that's a real madness you're mad against truth you're mad against god and that madness will lead to your own destruction and hasten your own destruction and that's what's going to happen in the life of jezebel she's not going to make it to 50 years old she will be dead and it's going to turn to her own destruction. The, the, the reality is, and, and it's a gradual thing, it doesn't happen overnight. Sinners don't reach this monstrosity of hatred toward God and a fearful height of defiance against God. They don't reach that in a moment. It takes a while for them to climb to that point. What happens is God tries to minister to them and their conscience is pricked and they kick against the pricks. And they, and they resist the conviction of God's Word and God's Spirit. And they do this over and over and over. And they get hardened and calloused and hardened and insolent. And eventually they're resentful in their mind. And they have hostility in their heart. And they have a kind of hatred such that if you walk in a room, sometimes they'll pick a fight with you. You didn't even say anything. There's just a burning hatred inside of them for God and for truth. And then God will turn that to their destruction. So, what does Jezebel do? Now, here's the madness. Look, if she wants to kill Elijah, why would you send a messenger to announce it? Verse 2, she sent a messenger. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we're coming to get you tomorrow. Okay, <laughs> I'll be back and gone tonight. <laughs> it's, that, it's no, no reason for me to hang around. Jesus said, shake the dust off your feet, go to another town and preach. You've already done your work there. There's no reason to stay. I mean, she felt so sure of her prey, she announced she was coming. And by the time she got there, he was gone. Look, now, now, in this point here, we're going to see, and, and how much time we have? We've got about 20 minutes left? Amen. All right, so, so let's see what happens. Uh, the, the message comes to him, verse 3, and when he saw that, uh, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, left his servant there, and he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness under the juniper tree. So we're going to see Elijah under the juniper tree. Now, I'm not going to be hard on Elijah. I'm just going to try and look at it for a moment. He had, had a great victory. He may have been uh, spent at that uh, particular moment. Uh, in, in the prior chapter, he was sustained by a vision of faith. He was trusting in his God for glory, and God manifested his glory. Here, he may have lost sight of the Lord for a little bit. And, and instead of, notice verse 3, and when he saw that, what's the that? The circumstances. When, when he, he lost the, 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 the vision of faith and saw the vision of circumstance, like when Peter stepped out and, and took his eyes off the Lord for a moment and all of a sudden saw the wind and the waves, at that moment we see Elijah acting in a way where instead of standing, now he's going to run into the wilderness. We're going to see Elijah in the wilderness here. Uh, uh, this happens all the time when we look in the wrong direction. Remember back in Genesis, Lot lifted up his eyes and he saw the plains 
and the watered plains and say, oh, this is a great place to be. And again, instead of lifting up high enough to God, he just lifted up high enough to see what's the best stuff that earth has to offer me. And that's the problem, perhaps, that happened here. I remember the time when Moses uh, was moving across the wilderness with his folks, and he said, okay, if you want to go spy the land, you can go spy the land. And when they came back, instead of seeing that God had given them a good land, they said, hey, we saw the giants. We were grasshoppers in our own eyes. And so instead of having the, the vision of faith, they had the vision of earth, which isn't the best place when you look around. And, and instead of the Reformation being carried forth in the land of Israel, at this point, Elijah departs because of the threatenings of Jezebel. And he runs off into the wilderness. Now, I guess one of the truths is life is marked by frequent change. I guess nothing is really stable in our short life. Things, things change. Job said, man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. Jesus said, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. I mean, welcome to planet Earth. I mean, though the victory is sure at the end, the truth of the matter is that we take this voyage across the sea of life. <laughs> We're going to be kind of like those uh, ocean liner mariners that go out there and they have to face some storms every so often. I remember that one psalm, it's uh, Psalm 107, talks about those that are in the sea up and down and up and down and their heart is melting inside of them and such is life. And, and it happens to anyone, including those who are in the will of God and those who are in the Word of God and those who are the servants of God. And there's the portrait right here of Elijah. Now, now, again, you know, too many people, I've heard too many sermons picking on him in this chapter. I don't, I'm not going to be that way. I'm not going to pick on him. Because I think the problem is, and, and, and it might be so, that you say, well, look, I expect more out of one of God's men than I expect out of a, re a regular guy. I expect more out of a minister than I expect out of a regular saved man. I expect more. Well, and, and maybe you're right. Uh, Paul did say that, that a good minister uh, should be an example to the believer. He should be an example in word, in, in conversation, you know, his behavior, in charity, in love in spirit, in faith, in, in purity, that, that he should show a pattern of good works. That's good. That, that in doctrine he should you know, show up on corruptness and he should be sincere and, 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 and grave. Not in the grave, but you know, with gravity and, and the way he handles himself. But, but, the remember, but God wants to show us in, in the Scriptures, uh, although he's a man of God, he's still a man. He's not God. He, he's still a man. He's not an angel. He, he's uh, he's compassed with a f infirmity. He, he, he's prone to making mistakes and sin and evil. It's, it's just, hey folks, be real. I know one of the things that costs a lot of breakups of a lot of good churches, a lot of people leaving good churches is they come in and initially they're enamored with the guy in the pulpit and then later on they find out he's just a guy up there in the pulpit and then they go away discouraged and they never have the right understanding. He's just a man. God has chosen to place his treasure in an earthen vessel. Not in one made of steel or one made of gold, but one made of just a cracked, marred, worthless vessel in and of itself. This idea of hero worship is a bad thing. And, and uh, you know, I've tried to avoid that trap I, uh, when I was a young Christian. Oh, you've got to read the biography of this guy and the, and the biography of that guy and this biography and that biography. And I thought, no, I don't think I want to do that because they're sanitized biographies. They were written by men, and, and uh, let me read what God has to say 
about people and, and try and get a right perspective. Let, let me give you a, a, a portrait. Um, go to the uh, Gospel of Mark to chapter 8. Look, look, God is jealous of his name and his power and, and his glory. He, he's not going to share it with another. Uh, we humans are, are prone to this hero worship, and then we're disappointed when we discover that our idol is just like we are made of clay. Look in, 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 in uh, Mark uh, chapter 8, uh, verse 22. Uh, he, that would be Jesus, uh, from earlier in the chapter, verse 17, uh, he cometh to Bethsaida, and, and they bring uh, to him a blind man, and besought him to, to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand, and he led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands upon him and asked him if he saw aught. Talk about in today's 21st century with us wiping ourselves with these little wipers all the time. That would have just, we'd have fallen over. Yesterday I was watching an old movie, and someone drank out of a bottle, and someone else drank out of it, and I think three people fainted in the room. And I said, well, they did that years ago. They weren't afraid. They weren't a bunch of sissies like we are today, bubble-wrapped and everything. Well, here's Jesus spitting on a guy's eyes. That would that would freak out. You'd have the, the thought police in there. But, but anyways, Jesus takes this man and he, he heals him in a particular way. Verse 24, and, and he, the man, looked up and he said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he, that be Jesus, puts his hands again upon his, the man's eyes, and made him look up and he was restored. And he saw every man clearly. Now, I, I, every time uh, uh, Jesus, you know, uh, uh, did a, a miracle or, or a healing, he seemed to do it a little differently. And, and I think there was a lot of reasons for that, one of which is people need different things. So he was able to do what they needed uniquely and particularly for them. I think the other thing was uh, Jesus did a little differently so that you couldn't say, wow, man, it's a formula. If I just get the formula right and the, and the mechanics right, it's always going to turn out the same way. It's not the formula. It's not the mechanics. It's the one performing it. It's God himself. So I'm not going to have a particular kind of prayer that's always going to get me a certain answer or a particular way of approaching God or doing something that's going to work. It's, it's understanding it's God inside of it, and it has to be real. But this healing I find kind of interesting. He's it, it, got to do it twice with this particular guy. And, and at first I didn't get it for years, and then I said, oh, my gosh, yeah, that's like all of us. I mean, the first time Jesus puts the touch to our eyes and we're excited, and we can see, if you will, truth for the first time in our life, we see men as trees walking. Wow, look at the great Dr. So-and-so. Man, I would like to be like Dr. So-and-so. It's not until Jesus gets the second touch, you see clearly and go, it's not Dr. So-and-so. If Dr. So-and-so, if, if Spurgeon led anyone to the Lord, it wasn't Spurgeon. If Whitley or Whitfield or Wesley or any, if any of those guys, it wasn't them. See, once you see it clearly, it was God working through them. So I don't need a statue. I don't need a college in their name. I don't need a curriculum that they came up with. They weren't the ones doing it. It was God through them. Hey, look, I'm thankful that God used Billy Graham to save people, but Billy Graham saved nobody. And I'm glad that God used a couple of men in the latter half of the 20th century to teach some people, like a Dr. Ruckman or a Dr. Hiles or whoever it is, but it wasn't them that ultimately got the instruction across. It was God that worked through them. The Lord is jealous of his honor. It, it, it has to appear that that's the excellency of his power. It's God alone and God only that can give the increase. And, and this, for this reason, God will show us in the Scriptures, like He's doing right here in this chapter, that, that the, the very best men that He has at their best are nothing more than men. You want a hero? His name is Jesus Christ. That's someone that will never let you down. That's the message God wants you to get across. Man 
at his best state is altogether vanity. That's what God says in the Psalms. Uh, so, so why should it be an incredible thing when you or I read of the failings and the falls of the most favored men of God who are His saints and His servants. Why are we surprised by this? If we would just allow Jesus to give the second touch to our eyes, we could see things clearly. And if you've only had the first touch to your eyes, you may still see men as trees. And don't be surprised if one day when that tree falls, timber, it falls on you. And it breaks up your relationship with God and breaks up your relationship with the church. And God doesn't want that to happen. Perfection is found in heaven. And on earth, it's only been found in one person. That's the Lord from heaven. That's Jesus Christ. Now, now, God writes these things back where we were in Kings and we see Elijah running off into the wilderness under the juniper tree. And he's writing this thing not so much that, that, uh, uh, that we can hide behind it and say, well, then that can happen to me too. Or not so much that we can make it as an excuse, but so much that we see the reality and that it can be a, a, a warning for us to heed and in sample for us to realize how we have to not look at the circumstances around but keep our eyes on the Lord. That's what he's trying to show. See, when, when Elijah saw that, he ran. If Elijah saw the Lord, do you think he would have run? If Elijah saw the Lord standing right next to him, he's going to run from God. He's going to stay right there. He's going to say to Jezebel, you sent 450 prophets, you need, you need 4,500 of your best servants to try and do this. Look who's standing next to me. So he's trying to show us that our strength alone is found in God. This is what he wants to impress on our mind and on our heart. Um, the, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, verse 117, Hold thou me up, and I shall be safe. Now, now he ends up in the wilderness. The wilderness in, in the Scriptures. The first time the wilderness is ever referenced in the Scriptures, take about 10 or 15 minutes to show you this. Go to Genesis chapter 14. In our voyage across the sea of life, with the ups and downs we're going to face, the reality is we're going to have times in the wilderness. Revelation 14, this is the first time the word is ever found. Um, it's talking about a war with the four kings against the five. And in verse 6 it says, And the Horites in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Now, now the Horites, they were a mountainous people. Uh, Mount Seir, Seir means a rough wooded area. A Paran means a cavernous area. It's a rough wooded area that's a wilderness. Uh, later on in uh, Genesis 21, 21, it says, He dwelt in Paran, in the wilderness of Paran. It's talking about Ishmael. In the wilderness of Paran. Later on in, in uh, Genesis uh, 36 and uh, verse 8, it says, and, and thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom, Mount Seir by the wilderness. So we're talking that the wilderness is a place where there's Esau, which is a type of the flesh, where there's Ishmael, a, a type of someone who is religious in rebellion against the true God, a wild man. The wilderness is a place where this exists. H how did it get this way? Go to Isaiah 14. This is a truth God wants us to understand. We had this call and asked the pastor the other day, if God is good, how come there's so much evil in the world? Because this is the wilderness of planet Earth, folks. This is not heaven. In heaven, everything is good. And hell is everything is bad. And here in the wilderness is the middle ground where the battle rages. Isaiah chapter 14. Now we know this passage from verse 12. It's about 
How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Verse 17, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof. Hey, you're on dangerous ground. We're on foreign soil. You're going to go to the mission field? You go into the foreign mission field? Hey, anywhere you are is foreign mission field. This is the wilderness right now. It's the wilderness of the world where, as I read to them the other day uh, when we were on Ask the Pastor, you want to know why this goes on? Ephesians chapter 2. Because people are walking according to the course of this present evil world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we also had our conversation in the times past. And we got a heck of a lot more people on the broad road following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit of disobedience than we have people on the narrow road following God. This is a wilderness down here, folks. It's mostly wilderness. Now, in this wilderness is the battleground. And, and I'll give you some verses. On one side, Genesis 16, verse 7. And we'll run out of time, so we'll look next week and see how the battle rages out in the wilderness. But, but Genesis 16, first time, And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness. It's a wilderness, but God hasn't abandoned it. He's still available to be sought. There's still a well of water in the wilderness. That's the goodness of God. A Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 5. Deuteronomy 29, verse 5. And, and, and in the 29th chapter, these are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel. And, and uh, he says in uh, verse 5, I've led you 40 years in the wilderness. That's God leading His people in the wilderness. So, so one thing you're going to see in the wilderness, yes, it's rough. Yes, it's scary. Yes, there's darkness. But God has not abandoned it. And we're going to see this later on in the chapter. But on the other hand, go to Luke chapter 8 and look at verse 29. Luke chapter 8 and verse 29. This is when Jesus arrived in the country of the Gadarenes. And he went forth uh, out to the land and there met him a man. Uh, verse 27. Uh, out of the city a certain man which had devils a long time. Verse 29. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oftentimes it, the unclean spirit, had caught him. And he was kept bound with chains and fetters. And he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, you're going to have the devil and you're going to have God and it's going to be a battle. Now, I'll give you two last verses and we'll be done. Go to the Gospel of Matthew and look at chapter 3. What's our job in the wilderness? Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. And in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Told you, the well's still there. God's there. The devil's there. Look at the next chapter. Look at verse 1. Here's God's man. Then Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. It's a battleground. But it's a battleground we're not going to be able to escape. It's a battleground where God's going to bring His men. And the great Elijah was brought there. Circumstance drove him there. I don't know what will get you there, but you'll find yourself there one day. What God wants you to know, and we'll see in the rest of this chapter, He's still there. The still small voice is out in the wilderness. The well is in the wilderness. So is the devil. But God wants you to stand in the spirit of Elijah, like John the Baptist, and to preach.
in the wilderness. So we're running out of time. Next week, I want to look and continue and see how that goes. But I hope some lessons tonight that we've learned. Life is a sea change. Things are going to happen. There will not be entire stability down here because of the circumstances and because the world has been turned into a wilderness by the prince of the power of the air that's working in the children of disobedience and yet God is there with a well. God wants to revive us. God wants to refresh us. And God wants us to speak His word so it will not return void. Amen. Any thoughts or comments before we end? And then let's pray. Father, thank you for, for uh, these chapters. They're, they're very instructive. They're, they're very helpful to us. Um, we don't want to be hero worshipers. We want to be Christ worshipers and God worshipers. Help us to get the second touch on our eyes, Lord, that we no longer see men as trees. We understand that they're just earthen vessels. It's your power, it's your glory, it's your word. So Lord, help us to stand, and having done all, to stand with thine armor. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen.